Hey everyone, thanks for listening to this episode of the Coffee People Podcast. While we put the show out into the world for free, it isn't free to create this content. This is my job. I mean, it's kind of a job. No, it's a job. Coffee People and the entire Roast West Coast Coffee Network depend on our industry partners and our paying subscribers to keep dropping these episodes week after week. Go to coffeepeoplepodcast.com to support the show. One time or monthly, you're making a huge difference to this little operation. Want a little something to show for your support? We got you. Check out the new merch, including hats, beanies, coffee cards, and journals. You'll find all the details on coffeepeoplepodcast.com. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Coffee People Podcast, which is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network and presented by Roastar Coffee Packaging. If you're a small business roasting excellent coffee that you want to showcase in some sturdy, well-crafted, recyclable cans or bags, like the ones they're turning around so quickly with holiday designs, you'll find what you're looking for at Roastar.com. I'm Ryan Wolt, and this is the Coffee People Podcast, where we meet interesting people connected to the world of coffee. Today, we're chatting with Luke Hales of Hasea Coffee Source. Luke is the brother and business partner of frequent podcast guest Jared Hales, and their green coffee importing company, Hasea Coffee Source, has long been a sponsor of this show. None of that is why I asked him to be a guest here today. Rather, it's because I found him to be a well-spoken, considerate person in coffee who didn't actually come into the industry earlier on as a barista or a coffee roaster. He had another successful career in a completely different industry, and yet he decided to step off the cliff into entrepreneurship anyways. We're going to get into what motivated that change, what Luke believes is the foundation of building a successful business, and what it's like to work with your family. Family is actually a big theme of today's show and being an entrepreneur often requires buy-in from those we love. I'll take just a moment to shout out my wife Trina for being amazing about letting me convert half our bedroom closet into this podcasting booth. Luke was at home during our chat too. It's his daughter you'll hear occasionally playing in the background. There is a lot to cover today, so let's get through the pre-pod checklist. Is your coffee mug full? If the answer is yes, you're ready for this Coffee People podcast conversation with Luke Hales, co-founder and the business half of Hasea Coffee Source in Anaheim, California. I actually want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, your family, Um, but before we do, we should probably know who you are, you know, starting with What's your name? You know, what's your coffee company? Why are we on this podcast today? Yeah, for sure. So I'm Luke Hales. I'm co-founder of Jose Coffee Source. Um, I started this company with my brother and actually my dad is also involved. We kind of made a decision back in 2019 that um, we all had very unique and separate skills and that we were going to essentially pool those together for our family. So we sort of made a decision that whatever we were going to do, we were going to kind of do together, you know, so however, you know, however that looks like for people is different. You know, my dad's been a Corvette restoration specialist for 35 years, which just means like a really fancy mechanic, you know, so he mostly does like full restorations, but he obviously knows how to work on cars as well. So just like, Even, you know, if we have an issue with our personal vehicles, like part of his contribution to that family community is helping us with that. You guys kind of made a pod before that was like a thing, like pre-COVID, right? In COVID, you kind of made your little pod, right? But you guys kind of had like a little family unit, like we're in this together. The timing of it was weird because, yeah, it was like late, um, late 2019. We were actually meeting like... I don't want to say weekly, maybe it was uh, every other week and we were developing like business plans and we didn't know what the business was yet. <laughs> you know, it was like we, you know, we we're kind of sitting around um, a family dinner and it, 
we were all talking about challenges we were having working for someone else and basically realizing that we were operating other people's businesses um, without a lot of the benefits and challenges too. I'm not trying to take away from those people's businesses, but we kind of had that moment of like, hey, like, why are we not doing this for ourselves? Like we all have these skills. So that was when um, it kind of started. And then, like I said, we were meeting and just kind of made that decision like, hey, we're going to, yeah, pod, that's like an interesting term. And then, yeah, COVID happened. And I think that became a lot almost like necessary, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is when we started our company, Hosea, is I remember, you know, like March 15th or whatever day that was, 2020, the governor got on the news and was like, the state's going to shut down. And everybody was like, I mean, I remember I I was texting the leadership team for my job, like, you know, this is like 6 p.m. We're all done for the day. Like, hey, do we like, what does this mean? Like, are, are we allowed to go to work tomorrow? You know, and the place I was working at does packaging for like surgery kits and and some aerospace stuff. So we kind of fell under that umbrella of essential or whatever the word they were using at the time. So it was just a weird day. And then that same day, my little brother, who actually worked for the same company, uh, another coffee importing company that my brother also worked for, my older brother, they both worked there. And he texted me like, yeah, we're getting laid off. You know, so I remember texting my older brother after hearing my little brother say that, like, hey, man, are you okay? Like, are you going to be good? And he was like, yeah, I'm not worried. Like, no big deal. And then like maybe a week later, he's like, hey, like, I think we could we could do what I'm doing, which he was he was a coffee buyer for another importer. And um, all, all a lot of the coffees, the majority of coffees get here in uh, summertime. So like we're just now getting the last of some coffees that are late. Uh, so March, February, January, those are all kind of negotiating months when we're getting um, offer samples and stuff like that. So my brother being the purchaser, it had all these relationships and all these people kind of like, Hey, where are we at with these, you know, these deals, these coffee purchases. And my brother had to be like, you know, I don't, I'm not involved anymore. I'm so sorry. Like reach out to these people or whatever, you know, then that's kind of what got him thinking like, Hey, we can do this. So we approached people and, you know, said, hey, can we buy you know, 10 bags, 20 bags, like whatever it was. And then I think we had an LLC open on actually, I know what day it was. It was tax day 2020. So it was April 15th. We opened our LLC. Still kind of not sure what it looked like, you know, but it was like, let's just do this. Something to do with coffee importing. Exactly. Along those lines. Exactly. We're really passionate about um, home roasters, uh, that kind of that community. Mm-hmm. So at first we were like really looking at like, okay, how do we serve home roasters? You know, there's there's not a huge amount of op- options for home roasters. And the options that are out there are kind of like um, on opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, you have like Sweet Maria's, which is like the you know, the original, the big guy, they're, they're really great. They have great coffees. Um, I love that. And I, then, I'm sure somebody at Sweet Maria's is going, wait, we're the big guy now? <laughs> <laughs> well, for the home roasters, you know, right. they're kind no, of, no, no, they're, I know. they are the guy, right? <laughs> you know, for, for us, if we're entering that space, you know, I would consider them, you know, using some business terminology, the worthy adversary, right? Which is good to have. You need like, you know, it makes a better a better marketplace when you have people who are worth competing against, you know? Yeah. They've been a resource for home roasters and even people looking to get into the profession, you know, with their education uh, side of it as well. I want to point out that people that are regular listeners of the show know your brother, Jared. He's a regular guest um, on this show as a coffee smarter expert. And so they know Hosea Coffee Source as a green coffee importer, and I push it as a place to get coffee education now. But so I'm really, I have not heard this part of the story of the beginning stages where we didn't quite know what this, what this endeavor was going to look like. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we had ideas. I mean, Jared kind of, Jared knew that education and a little bit of this niche of home roasters was definitely something we wanted to do. Of course, he had all these roasters that were kind of like hey man like where'd you go like i liked working with you you know and that first year 
it was just, it was kind of like figuring that out. We didn't have a lot of coffee because in April, you know, there's only so much coffee for sale. And we come from a working class family. We all have worked very hard since we were young and we don't have any kind of like trust fund or, you know, like (laughs) there's no big cash uh, provider anywhere. So it was kind of like, okay, let's just start with bringing some of these coffees in and seeing what, what we can do. So we ended up getting a couple of wholesale clients and it became really apparent to me that in order to serve home roasters, uh, you, you need a wholesale side to things just for scaling, right? Mm -hmm. The numbers, right? a box of coffee to get it from Ethiopia or from Colombia or Brazil or wherever costs a certain amount. And whether you put a bag in it or you put 320 bags in it, that cost is essentially the same. So then it kind of turned into a little bit of math where I'm telling Jared like, Hey man, we, we actually kind of need some wholesale to, to, I think make what we really, you know, part of, the second half of what we want to do really makes sense and to be competitive. So that's where we kind of were talking like, cause we were, again, wholesale was never not talked about. It was just kind of like, well, it's, you know, cash intensive and it's got a lot of, um, a lot of hurdles, I guess it's difficult, Mm -hmm. you know? So once we kind of had a good idea of what it was going to take to get coffee here, uh, and that, that's the, that's the whole thing about our business from a, a sourcing standpoint is scaling is kind of everything. Um, you know, the work it takes to cup a sample, to grade it, to negotiate it, to buy it is the same, whether you're buying again, I'll go, I'll just use these extremes, one bag or like, you know, 2000 bags, whatever it is, <laughs> right. It's the right. same amount of work. So right away we were kind of mathing out that whole idea is like, okay, for all this to work, scaling, scaling is what's going to have to happen. That's a very retail problem. I mean, right? Like anyone who's building a widget or selling a shirt or anything, that first piece, that first product, the cost of design, the cost of figuring out the manufacturing, the cost of production is all going to be, it's all going to be up here no matter what. And it's only once you get past that that starting point that you start selling in quantities, you know, five shirts, 10 shirts, 100 shirts, that the price per each starts coming down. And there has to be a, a tipping point of where if I don't sell this many, you know, I'm breaking even or losing money. And yeah, exactly. that can be tough. Totally. Yeah. So these aren't like new concepts or anything. The other side of like wholesale becoming like a big part of our business plan was that, you know, I can, I can go Google right now where my local roasters are and I can go visit them, you know, and introduce myself and try to leave a card and try to invite them to come cup with me and try to build relationship where like the home roaster is not, I can't go look up their addresses. (laughs) It'd be kind of weird if I did. Right. I can't go knock on their door and be that like, feels hey, like a list you could buy from Google or something. <laughs> you like, probably could. Hey, who's right? been searching for these terms, Google? I'll give you 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you see kind of the difference. So, um, you know, the other thing I we kind of quickly decided was that uh, the home roaster side of our business was definitely going to take a lot of organic growth. And the home roaster is like, it's all about trust for them. All of our talks are about like, okay, how do we give people a cheap, easy way to get introduced to us, to give us a try, basically, knowing that these people can be really loyal to whoever they're buying from and they're pretty picky. You know, the home roasters are really intense. They're, they, they're doing it because they love it. You know, a lot of the talks are just about like, how do you give people that, you know, easy way to enter, you know, basically an introduction without ever meeting them. Right. Sure. How do you how do you introduce your product yourself to someone without ever getting to meet them? And that's why our website's designed the way it is and all this stuff. 
So your brother has a natural connection in the coffee industry. You're coming from this other world, which let me just say, hysterical that the employees at the In-N-Out Burger near me and the people working in the aerospace industry were both on the same essential level. <laughs> what made you think, you know what, this career over here, where, you know, things are up in the air, but it's still a stable career. We didn't know then that COVID was going to last for as long as it did with work restrictions and that sort of thing. Right. What made you think, I know we're, we're talking about doing this business, but I think I'm going to do it. I'm actually going to leave this paycheck knowing that you're also married. You've got a, a small child. Like you're, yeah. you know, you're living this life of a family man. Yeah, it definitely was scary. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and sorry to cut you off right away, but you could have just gone out and got another, you know, a work from home job. Nothing could just easily do it. But like, yeah. you could have started applying for other jobs that have things like benefits and so on. Yeah, well, actually, I never lost my job. I had my job was totally stable. So our, our work slowed down for like maybe a month, just as people kind of the shock of what was happening um, did kind of stall things. But truthfully, um, I was gainfully employed. <laughs> Oh, so you just made a, COVID. a crazy decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> uh, what I'll say is, first of all, I, I, I believe in my brother. I believe in myself. I believe in my family. For me, it was, you know, I was making a great paycheck. I was pretty good at what I did. Um, I basically designed manufacturing processes sort of like a manufacturing engineer almost, except I'm just not um, traditionally educated in that way. The thing about my old industry is that in manufacturing, everybody's upset all the time, I feel like. <laughs> your, your customers are upset even though you like went above and beyond and you got some project done for them that should have taken a month. You got it done in three weeks. They ask you why you couldn't do it in two. Um, your vendors are upset about something, you know, it's just, it's just a stressful environment where people just aren't really happy. So right away I was working full time while also building our business. Uh, we all did that again, coming from not really any kind of like big money. We all had some money saved because our parents taught us like the value of saving money. So I've always been pretty fiscally like um, secure in that manner. I call it the war chest. You know, <laughs> I had a little <laughs> bit of a war chest saved up, but really I, uh, actually all of us worked for about two years while we were also operating this business. Wow. And so I would, you know, I would, uh, in manufacturing, I was the manager. So I'd go in and I'd get all the machines ready. I get the coffee made for my employees before they would come in, that sort of thing. So my, my day started at, um, you know, I was at work at, five, five thirty most mornings. And then as our business got bigger, I kind of started leaving earlier and earlier for my other job because I was salary. I didn't really need to be there per se. And I would go to our warehouse and I'd go fill orders there from, you know, three to sometimes nine o'clock or whatever, whatever it took. We we did that for a few years. And so I don't want to say like it wasn't scary to leave that job when it finally came time. I was leaving with a business that kind of was already operating and really like we knew that we could afford to pay myself a little bit now at that time when I when I did leave my job a lot less than what I was making. But again, <laughs> that investment in yourself uh, makes it a lot easier. So jumping ship, it was kind of like looking at the books looking at what we were making and going okay like we can afford this it's not great but we can afford it sort of a thing that's a really pragmatic way to look at it for one i think you're part of this generation just behind me you're probably about my i think you're i don't want to say in the air I'm but you're probably about my 30. brother's age okay so yeah similar where we my generation was kind of told go do everything the traditional way and you'll right. be fine and that yeah. was all a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was all a lie. Student but learns. we were also taught, hey, you should look for careers and things that make you happy and make you passionate. Right. And there's kind of this little gap in there of like jobs used to just be jobs. And then all yeah. of a sudden they became these things that fulfill you. 
And now we're in this weird hybrid land where it's like, well, I want a job that fulfills me, but I also want to make sure I'm stable because we've just seen the economy get thrown upside down a few times. Right. So it sounds like you kind of picked both both lanes essentially and straddled it until you found a place where you felt comfortable. Yeah, I mean, um, it was a lot of work. My wife was not loving it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it put it still put a lot of strain on on like the personal side of life for a short period of time, which, you know, I kept having to reassure my family like, hey, this is this is unto something, right? This is a short term investment. And if you don't have money, you have time, you know, that's, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> so, you know, we call it sweat equity, like you, you got to put your sweat, sweat equity in, in order to get it right. So the other thing, again, when we talk about scaling, um, I'm, I'm going to say that a lot, <laughs> probably too much for your podcast. So feel free to edit a few out, but basically right away, we did the math on what it looks like to hire one person, what it looks like to hire two people and the scale that has to happen for that to make sense. So right away, everything was quantified for us really easily. And I mean, we were using numbers that were estimated because we didn't really know yet, but we were making educated guesses essentially. And we, we continue to do that. Like all of our decision making is essentially just a matrix of, of numbers. And, you know, when, when revenues hit X, we should be af- able to afford Y. And I think that's really important for anyone who's going to start a business because I've seen it with other people where it's like they're not at scale where they could be or, or I don't want to say should be because that's kind of a harsh word, but like where they need to be for it to make sense. And so now they're like being forced to kind of overcharge or like, they're, they're doing things that aren't necessarily making sense for their customers because they need to make a certain amount or they need to, you know, have a certain revenue. Um, and that's just not the way, unfortunately, the marketplace works. They're being reactive and not proactive. You know, they're, they're reacting to their situation, right? Or am I misunderstanding that? I, I mean, I, yeah, again, I'm, I'm trying to like not because I don't think it's like it's just you you have to be like the math for us was like how how much in sales can one person facilitate mm-hmm. okay well if it's x then you have to get to x before you can pay that person to, to facilitate that sales you know what i mean like you can't expect to make money for yourself or for your business really if you're not at the scale that kind of normalizes things sure. you know so if I have one small roaster client, I can't charge them and pay for my like my personal overhead. <laughs> you know, like selling 50 bags a year or whatever. Like that's just like I would have to charge my the the roaster like $10 a pound. You see? So like it was a little bit of like back engineering and also again estimating how much business, you know, and then like even like uh, square footage wise, like, okay, we have so much square footage. How many pounds of coffee can we facilitate in this square footage? And it costs that square footage costs this much. Okay. So if we know we can facilitate X, then our square footage only needs to be priced, you know, a penny per pound that we sell. So if we tried to pay for our square footage with what we were selling when we first started, then we'd be overpriced and not, not competitive. And that's not fair to really anyone. So it's this, it's, it's kind of this weird complicated thing of like trying to figure out like where, where is fair, you know, and competitive. And then, so then when we came up with our pricing model, we started selling it and people were buying it. And then we were kind of seeing where other competitors were and we were in line with them where things can be in line. I mean, we definitely deal with like, you know, the upper end of coffee. So sometimes it's hard to like directly compare pricing, but in general, where it mattered, we were seeing Mm -hmm. ourselves be competitive and that's like, okay. And that's telling me we didn't pick that number because our competitors were there. We picked that number because we created a math equation essentially that said, we think that every salesperson can handle this much in sales 
in this amount of warehouse space with these costs and overhead. Um, so when those two met, all of a sudden we were like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> okay, I think we're, we're on to something. And it took a couple adjustments too, by the way, if we didn't get it the first time, you know. Right. No. And I know some of your clients, obviously I have a, a relationship with Asaya. And one of the things that I've heard from them time and time again is they net, when I say, well, why do you work with Asaya? They never go, oh, because they're the cheapest. They go, oh, right. because we have this relationship. They provide me with a fair price, a quality product, and this ongoing uh, business relationship that benefits me, which I always find to be rewarding as somebody who, you know, who also works with you, collaborates with you. The Coffee People podcast is presented by Rostar Coffee Packaging. Rostar is a digital printing company that makes custom printed packaging for coffee products. They work with small, mid, and large coffee roasters nationwide. Go to Rostar.com to learn more about their fast turnaround times, high quality packaging products, sustainability efforts, and low printing minimums, which enable your small business to tell a really big story. If you are ready to upgrade those coffee bags, go to Rostar.com. I want to change tracks a little bit from the business side of things and just ask you about about coffee. Were you a coffee person beforehand? I mean, I know your brother was in that world, but did you have that background or was that something you cared about or was it just, oh, I drink coffee and this is a good business opportunity? <laughs> so a little bit of both, you know, truthfully. I mean, obviously Jared had been in this for so long that I was exposed to really good coffee for a long time before this business. Um, I always thought it was really interesting what he did. I, I, I like to tell people, oh yeah, my brother is in coffee and he gets to go to all these different places. So I always, I was always attracted to what he was doing. I mean, I never, I did take my leadership team, you know, we used to do these team buildings and we went and took Jared's cupping class, you know, as a team with my old company, but I was never pursuing a career in coffee. I drank coffee every day. Coffee was very utilitarian for me. You know, I drank Folgers a lot because that's like what we had at the shop. And it was like, make the, make the pot for the whole crew and grab a cup at the end, you know, once everybody got theirs. So at, you know, at five in the morning, the incentive to like pull out all the equipment <laughs> and, you know, brew, brew like a nice cup of coffee is tough. Um, I actually used to tell people, I would joke around. I said, uh, my brother ruined mediocre coffee for me. You know, I was, ignorance is bliss, right? Oh yeah, so I was, for sure. I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I was perfectly happy <laughs> drinking terrible coffee in the morning as a, you know, as a tool. And then, um, as my brother got into this business and I, he was sharing coffees with me and I have coffee where he was, or I'd go to his, you know, a cafe that he was associated with or whatever. So I knew that coffee was much bigger than what it was in my personal life just at the time and for a long time because of the lifestyle I was in, the, the job I had, coffee just had a different role is what I would mm -hmm. say. And I would bring in nice coffee sometimes and brew it for, for, you know, a, a crew, but it's like on a black and Decker, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it never quite did it justice. I actually got a automatic brewer this year uh, from Simply Good Brewers. You'd find that link in the show notes here. And I love it, but it's also made me lazy because in that early morning when I get up and I'm looking at, well, this one I have to do some work for. And this one, right. I just kind of press the button. Which sure. one do I want to do at 7 a.m.? Yeah. I still make myself, you know, work back and forth, but it's <laughs> the option is there now. I was just going to say, I have a Bona Vita. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll make a, a pot of coffee still pretty regularly if I'm busy. So I'm, I'm there with you still. I'll tell you what, I, I've never had an automatic brewer before this year. I find a lot of value in having it because I may not make my first cup of the day on it, but I make my second pot and sometimes my afternoon decaf pot there on it. And it's just is kind of there and exists for me in this continual stream of coffee that my life has become. <laughs> right. You know, we've been talking about this being a family business. I know your dad's involved and your brother's involved. But also, your, by extension, your family, your wife and your daughter end up being involved. 
I've sure. met them at, at coffee events, uh, yeah. certainly your wife. What is it like working with family? I mean, is has it been what you guys had hoped? Is it manageable? Uh, are you going to announce a dissolution of the business on the show? Like, what's the situation? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think all working with family kind of does is sometimes creates a, a potential. I'm going to say potential because it doesn't necessarily happen this way every time. It creates the potential to have like a height, a heightened emotional response to problems or successes. Again, because of our skill sets being pretty different. And also, I mean, just by chance, complimentary, not necessarily clashing. I've taken a lot of training on leadership and personality types to become a more effective manager at my old job. And there are different personality types that just kind of naturally clash, right? Like if you're analytical, you're going to clash with the type A, like, doer, because the doer is just going to be like, let's get this done. And you're like, yeah, but I need all the information, you know, that kind of thing is there. But typically, it is more about the type of personality than the person. So we are just kind of fortunate enough to have a decent spread of personality type and skill set that that doesn't happen very often. I also think it can be easier in a lot of ways, because if we do have a problem, there's nothing easier than a brother to tell another brother that they're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) So, and then it just becomes a discussion, right? Again, if anyone is going to do business with family, my suggestion is I will fall back on like the business plan, the business ethos, which is different than ours. You know, Jared's personal beliefs vary from my personal beliefs, varies from my dad's personal, you know, so we, we sat down and, and decided on a kind of a business guideline on how we're going to make decisions. So it's not me making a decision. It's not my brother making a decision. It's not dad making a decision. It's this decision matches the business's plan, the business idea, you know, goals, all that. So as long as you can kind of separate those things out, then you can be pretty successful with family. I find that very uh, impressive. Personally, I have two brothers as well, and I can already just feel the rage climbing up my neck thinking about going into business with them (laughs) both simultaneously. And I mean that with as much love as I can, I can possibly give, but where our, our, uh, our personalities would certainly clash. I think we all saw what the other one was doing. was like, I'm going to go in a different direction with my life. (laughs) (laughs) And yet somehow we all ended up as our entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's it's, it's how does that work out? Which I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Like recognizing that I think is uh, really important too. You know, like I thought about my brother and my dad before we went into business together. Like, okay, like what, what are the potential you know, family dynamics, that could be a problem. And I just, I didn't see them. I saw the benefits being way better than the drawbacks. So like, if you see that, then there's nothing wrong with being like, you know what? Like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to not do that with them, you know? So we also, like I said, because we've created this pod type thing, I like that word you used earlier. So I'm going to steal it. There's other benefits outside of just like Hosea that we're providing for each other. And it's just kind of creating like a shared resource pool for each other in that manner. So I think that helps too, because it's more than just like this one business. It's kind of all these other aspects that we've decided to kind of tie in with each other on. I'm wondering about the business and being what I would call, tell me if this is the right term, an indie coffee importer. And I say indie because you're kind of like this family (laughs) independent business. And it sounds Indy cooler sounds than cool. just saying yeah. small, <laughs> small, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's small relative to like this, you know, you're not bringing in Starbucks level quantity, but you're working with uh, smaller businesses, uh, roasters, uh, home roasters. How much, do, what advantages do you think that brings? You know, what, obviously I think challenges are more obvious to people. Like you're negotiating against bigger contracts. You you know, bigger companies can undercut their price to take advantage of a situation to get something they want. But what advantages does being a small, you know, say nimble indie coffee roaster uh, give you? Yeah. Um, This is, 
I, you know, I think the biggest thing is, and I don't necessarily think this is just because we're small, just catering your service to individuals, which is a lot of work. What I see more of is that the things that we're doing that other importers don't do is mostly work related, like workload related. You know, and, and maybe that's just like a like a byproduct of having like employees versus owner operated. I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but maybe that is part of it. Like how do you get people to buy in as much as someone who owns it kind of a thing? But really all we do is cater catering to individual people and treating people like people, you know. Um every roaster has kind of a unique challenge that they're dealing with. So trying to meet them the best you can for those challenges makes it really easy to make someone happy, truthfully. You know, when somebody says like, oh, well, I, you know, I can't really hold coffee where I'm at because I do this or that. It's like, well, I'll just deliver it right to where you're roasting. And it's like, oh, really? Like, yeah, just tell me the day you'll be there and I'll, you know, and I'll just bring it there, you know. So the cost of that is relatively low, but it purchases quite a bit of goodwill. So whether or not that can scale is going to just be dependent on how seriously we take our hiring process when we get there and also like giving people who work here uh, eventually, not that anyone works here now, but eventually people who will work here, (laughs) the freedom and the room and autonomy to continue that, you know, something we've talked a lot about is like one, like our base a base wage for any employee is going to be relatively high. So all of our pricing models accommodate for that salary eventually. And then on top of that, like, you know, if you have a delivery driver, you know, you're, you have to tell them like, Hey, like your job is not to get this coffee delivered as quickly as possible. You know, you should have 15, 20 minutes planned with each person you drop off. That might not happen. You know, they're, if they're roasting, they, they may just, oh, thank you. You know, see you later. But like the freedom and space to say, hey, like you're, you can stay there and talk to them and, and, you know, answer any questions they might have or just listen to them, what their challenges are this week or whatever it is, you know, kind of passing on that to employees will definitely probably be a challenge just because it's easy uh, you know, as the owner to really want to do that and then just finding people and again, creating the environment where they feel like they're allowed to do those types of things and really provide service to people in that way. Sure. That's, uh, I'm that's volunteering to be the delivery driver. <laughs> just driving around from coffee place to coffee place sounds like a pretty good gig. So miserable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I got 20 you're... minutes to have a cup of coffee. Sure. Why not? I, I was going to say, on some of these days I get eight espresso shots deep and I'm like, woo, <laughs> everybody wants to make you a coffee. It's really awesome. Um, and that's just, that's the industry, man. Like everybody's so like pretty much across the board. Everybody is really cool. So um we also talk a lot about like picking and choosing who we work with like we want to work with people who have kind of that same mentality we have is like treat people right um you know and so then it makes it a lot easier to do business if if your customers are cool and your vendors are cool and and the farms you get to work like if everybody's cool man it's it's a lot of fun (laughs) (laughs) that was the first time in this uh interview where i felt like you didn't sound like a business guy Everyone's just cool, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but man, I think I it comes back too to business-y. that. No, no, no. It's good. I think it it does come back to that. Like there are these business stratagems you got to meet, but at the end of the day, you're dealing with people. Yeah. Which makes me wonder, how are you engaging with these customers? I mean, you mentioned, you know, going out and finding local roasters, but how are people finding you now? You know, now that you, you're three years, I think, into this, at least. Yeah, just about. You know, are people finding you? How are you connecting with more and more customers? How can people who are interested in saying, you know what, I'm thinking either I'm thinking about starting roasting or I am roasting and I'm interested in, you know, starting a relationship. How are they connecting with you? Yeah, it's it's always a little different. There's definitely kind of just the natural, hey, I found you online. Uh, You know, your website looks good or whatever. The coffee looks good. What's the next step? And that's great. 
what's funny is normally if somebody just kind of cold emails us, the first email back is, hey, can we schedule a call together? And that call is, you know, usually, um, you know, 15 to, to an hour, depending on the personality <laughs> type that you get. Right. And and it's us trying to figure out how cool they are. No, <laughs> no, it, it's kind of like, like, okay, what's your business? Like, what are your unique uh, needs? What are your, your unique challenges? It's exactly what I just talked about. So even those kind of organic, you know, hey, I found you, the next step for us is always, hey, can I get on a call with you and start that relationship? There's that. There's definitely, you know, just like I said, this area from LA to Orange County is got a lot of really great roaster. It's pretty dense around here. There's a lot of people, so it makes sense. And there's definitely an element of, hey, you know, I'm going to just drive around today and visit roasters and just introduce myself, let them know I'm out there, let them know I'm here, I'm local. I have coffees here locally. That is one of our big advantages, just like from a practicality standpoint, is that most coffee is stored in Oakland or somewhere else. So there's not actually that much coffee stored in LA. So most people are going to buy it and they're going to have to ship it from Oakland or somewhere else. So having, you know, especially if you're like a one cafe, two cafe operation, and you go through maybe three or four bags a month. And now you got to order like a pallet at a time to make sense for your shipping, you know, or buy three or four bags at a time and pay the same amount of shipping that it costs to ship a pallet, you know, which is like 10 or 12 bags. Also, now I'm again offering like, hey, I'll deliver, you know, one bag a week for you or two bags every other week, you know. It's almost like a boutique concierge experience as needed. I'm not saying it is, you know, all the time, but because you're you're nimble, you can you can make those calls, like you said earlier. I really liked the way you said that. It was, um, it's easy to make people happy. Yeah. It, well, it's it. You know, again, I. So our business has to make sense for it to keep going, right? Like, if you have a great idea, but your business doesn't make sense and you're losing money, your great idea will will fail with that poor business structure. Hang on. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I just, I know it sounds, it sounds obvious. No, no, I, I mean like, it seriously. As someone who started a coffee podcast, who's trying to make it a business, it's, it's a true statement. You got to figure out how you're going to pay your bills. You can have the best product. And if your plan and structure isn't right, that best product will not meet people in the capacity that it should and could. So if you believe in what you're doing, don't neglect the business because the business is like the vessel in which you get to do those things. So that that's why I like, I don't have a problem. I don't want to sound too businessy, <laughs> but for me, that's kind of the role I have a lot here is like, you know, I joke around Jared's the dreamer and I'm <laughs> the one who's like making sure that the dream can survive and turn into a reality, you know, like Jared has a lot of these ambitious ideas and he, and he's great at like meeting these, these um, producers and getting out there and he finds really good coffees. And it's like, dude, if we can't, if we can't facilitate the sale of these coffees, our producers are going to hurt. We're going to hurt, you know, like, so the business is super important. So, but, but it is unto the idea of, um, we believe in what we're doing and we believe in the product we're providing and we believe in the mission that we have and the people we get to work with on the producing side and the people we get to sell to here and work with here on the roasting side. Like we believe in all that. So it's, it's a responsibility to make sure that the business side is right. <laughs> so that's why I don't ever let them not be tied some way, you know, personally. I mean, honestly, I'm going to come back and listen to this show and like take notes because I feel like I'm learning <laughs> a lot right now. Oh, gosh. Good luck. I want to clarify, too, that you don't just work with clients in the L.A. area. I know you have a wide range of clients kind of all over. So if someone's listening to this somewhere else, they can still reach out to you, right? I'm not, I'm not making that up. Yeah, definitely. So continuing on that, how do we get how do we reach people? 
Um, there's visiting, there's obviously the organic, there's the ref, the referral, which is always really great. Another roaster, which I always find really, really awesome is if your customer base is telling essentially their competitors in some way, right? Like there's so Mm -hmm. much space in this coffee industry. Like I don't really think roasters are necessarily directly competing with each other yet. I still think they're competing with like the commercial coffee market overall, but still, you know, you can see it as, as a, as a competitor. And we have clients who are telling these other roasters, like, dude, you got to get the best stuff. You want the best (laughs) service. You got to go to Hosea. Like, so that's always a really cool one. And then lastly, which is what we just kind of started doing a lot more is traveling and visiting roasters. So we work a lot in the Denver area in Colorado. Um, we have some little pockets around Utah that we kind of work in a little bit. Um, anywhere on the West Coast, I think we can compete pretty easily with other importers. As you get to East Coast, now people have different coffees out there. Mm-hmm. So shipping from West Coast to East Coast can get expensive. So that's kind of the biggest barrier there. Uh, eventually I think we'll need coffees on both East and West coast as we scale. Usually the way that works is we try to cup in the area that we're visiting. Actually, you managed to come to our cupping in Colorado cause you were there. For Just something coincidental. Else. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was there drinking beer. <laughs> okay. You're <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were allowed to say. Yeah. Yeah. So that was oh, no. really cool. Lots and lots of beer. Yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> it's the perfect compliment for coffee. Yeah, so typically the way that works is I actually just went to Vegas area. The Vegas area has a really interesting coffee scene happening. Um, a lot of smaller roasters, you know, mid to small roasters are popping up. And also I'm noticing like coffee companies that started in 2019 have three shops now, you know. I think maybe it's a little cheaper out there to maybe get real estate. That might be part of it. Um, Maybe health departments easier. I don't know. So I was noticing a lot of like what I would consider newer roasters out there with multiple shops. So this trip was just kind of an intro trip, like just passing out cards, telling people we're there. And then maybe in six months, I'll start trying to reach out more to people I already met somebody who potentially will let us hold like a public cupping for other roasters to come try our coffees. Cause that's kind of the, at the end of the day, all we're doing is connecting producers with roasters and the coffee kind of has to do the rest of the work. You know, it's, it's either, it's either good or not good. (laughs) And for, for us, it's going to be good. The coffee is going to be good. So for us, Getting coffee in front of people is really the challenge. And then once the coffee's in front of people, the work gets a lot easier for sure. Uh, I'll send you the dates that I'm going to be in the Las Vegas area. If you could plan the cupping around then, that would be <laughs> ideal. If you buy the beers after. <laughs> that seems reasonable. Uh, I think last time you gave me coffee and you bought the beer. so <laughs> You are no longer waking up at 5 a.m. and brewing pots of Folgers uh, at work. Yeah. When you're yeah. out on the road saying hello to people or stopping into a new roaster, what do you what do you order? Oh man. Um it's always a little different. I try to balance between like I'll do an Americano usually or just like a batch brew. I a batch brew is what I'm gonna drink personally most of the time. The reason I'll order like an Americano is because I kind of like to see how their espresso is dialed in and a shot of espresso is just a little too much when you're doing, you know, maybe eight (laughs) or nine of them in a day. So (laughs) you need a little hydration. So I still feel like I'm getting that espresso experience in an Americano. If I'm trying to introduce myself to roasters, when I'm ordering a drink, I really am kind of seeing what kind of coffee they're buying. Cause there is a part of the market that just will always, that will probably never be our client base and that's okay. You know, there's, there's a place for everyone. Right. And they're, they're just kind of using, you know, baseline specialty coffees, you know, 83 point regionals, stuff like that. So I'm just trying to like filter that out as best as I can when I'm, when I'm finding new roasters. 
a like a, a coffee explorer archaeologist trying to figure out <laughs> uh, reverse engineer what are they buying from this menu here that i recognize uh <laughs> it's it's more just a quality thing you know what did i miss today is there something is there anything that we should make sure people know before we call it because we're already coming up on an hour and people get sick of me after about 45 minutes yeah for sure i'm definitely not all about business <laughs> <laughs> I love coffee. I dived into this coffee world pretty much head first. Um, I should be able to finish my Q graders this December. I have one more triangulation I have to pass. I've been working with a licensed Q grader and coffee expert, Jared, my brother, every day for the last three years. So I've become pretty passionate about what we're doing. You know, I want to make sure people know coffee. We, I love coffee. <laughs> I love coffee and I love working in coffee. You know, we talked a lot about business today because I do feel like that's important, you know, and, and for roasters too. Like there's so many roasters we get to meet that are passionate about what they're doing and believe in what they're doing. And the business part is maybe the biggest challenge for them and also the biggest frustration. So I, I feel like it's important to talk about these concepts because, again, like if you have something special that you want people to experience, it just has to make sense. And that's the only way you get to continue to like share what you have with people, unless it's a hobby and, and those are usually expensive on your end. So. <laughs> well, that's one of the things that I keep hearing from your customers who I talk to because I have actively started stealing from your network <laughs> is that when they are working with you, they get the feeling. And I believe to be true as well, that yes, they are your client. You are selling them something and trying to make a profit, but you also care about their success. You For want sure. them to succeed because then by extension, you'll also succeed, but it's a, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and 100%. they feel that energy coming from you where if you had to choose between the two, I'd rather we both lift up instead of just one of us lift up and pushing the other one down. And, and that's a, an honorable way to go about business. And I think something that people recognize when they work with the sale. Well, that's awesome feedback. That's really cool. That, that is definitely our goal. I mean, we, we do go above and beyond, I would say with just trying to, like you said, help people along with what we know. Jared has operated and and worked in roastery so he knows those challenges i i am just learning from him and i would say again i have a general business training and and education so all we're trying to do is exactly what you just said is help passionate roasters on the client side it's really it's that's what it's really about you know and yeah it is self-serving in that sense of the better they do the more coffee they order hopefully from me but i'm not sitting there like well you ordered a bag from someone else this week so i'm not going to answer that <laughs> question you know and i just think if you're interested in getting involved in coffee roasting we'd love to participate in your coffee journey and we have some really amazing coffees from some really amazing producers I guess that's the last, maybe one of the last things I'll say is that none of this gets done without really incredible producers working incredibly hard. So if you ever do get a chance, uh, go to an origin that uh, is producing coffee and see the work that goes into it. You will appreciate coffee more. You'll pay more for it without worrying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still worrying, but I'm not going to not pay more for it. I'll there you that. go. Okay. Maybe you're going to worry, <laughs> but, but you'll understand the work, the absolute insane amount of work that goes into this coffee just so that we can have this brown water. <laughs> it's such an existential crisis for me because I have learned all of these steps and I have seen them firsthand now. And I still sometimes look at my cup of coffee and be like, wait, I, this only cost me five bucks, you know, or whatever it was, I know. you know, wherever I might be. I'm like, how yes. is that even, po it just does the math. No, I'm not a math guy. So that's <laughs> why I struggle, but it, it, it is an incredible journey that coffee takes to get to us. And so for I appreciate sure. that you are part of that. And, and thanks for spending an hour with me. I was hoping to cut us short, like at a half hour, but I just kept going. Oh, sorry, man. Feel free to cut <laughs> out whatever, whatever sounds bad, <laughs> whatever's it boring. All, it was all good. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Luke. I, I appreciate you. All right, Ryan. Have a great day. A 
Okay, some key takeaways from today. Hosea Coffee Source is a family business that started as family first, not necessarily coffee first. They started developing this plan with their pod before knowing for certain which direction they were going to go. What was certain was that they wanted to go that direction together. Once the destination was green coffee importing, it was the home roaster, the small roaster, that inspired the team at Hasea. But in order to stay in business for the long term, they needed a plan to scale. I'm paraphrasing a bit, I think, but to Luke, scaling is everything. Those are the things that he was thinking about when he was putting in the sweat equity at night after finishing up with his day job. No doubt, the double duty was a strain on his personal life, but the payoff is coming now in the autonomy that his new career is offering for the long haul. Working with family can be highly stressful. I'll vouch for that. My dad's probably out there listening right now and nodding along. But it can also be incredibly rewarding, and the family connection sometimes offers more avenues for communication, both good and bad. When working with your family, creating a foundation for making business decisions is crucial. It isn't Luke vetoing his brother or vice versa. It's voting on what is best for the business. Because when you're indie and nimble, it's easier to make clients happy. Finally, while I was in Denver, my favorite beer, and this is an absolute coincidence, was a beer from my own neighborhood. Carl Strauss Brewing's Golden Coffee Stout was absolutely stellar and paired with some Kraft Gourmet Pizza... Oh my, I've had dreams about it. Strong recommend for any coffee and beer lover out there. Also, Carl Strauss is not a sponsor of this show. If you're listening, give me a call. Thanks to Luke for spending some extra time with me for this podcast. Hasea Coffee Source provides green coffee to roasters of all sizes. You'll find the link to HaseaCoffee.com in this show's podcast notes, and of course on CoffeePeoplePodcast.com. That is also where you'll find this pod's newsletter, which not only features recaps of these episodes, but Coffee Smarter Education, barista features, and even interviews with the designers of our favorite coffee packaging. Head to coffeepeoplepodcast.com to check it out and support the show. And if you find yourself in Southern California over the next month, don't forget to stop by Zumbar Coffee and Tea, Steady State Coffee Roasting, Camp Coffee Company, and or Ascento Coffee Roasters to guess how many coffee beans are in the jars. We're running a holiday guessing game contest at all four. The winners will receive $50 gift cards or coffee and merch to the aforementioned, courtesy of Roast West Coast. The contest runs through December 14th. We've already had almost 400 guesses, so we might be adding some extra prizes. Thanks to all the rest of our great industry partners, including our presenting sponsor, Roastar Coffee Packaging. Learn about them at Roastar.com. You'll find an excellent packaging company that tells the big stories of small business coffee roasters. And Moster Coffee Company, Ascend Coffee Roasters, Ignite Coffee Company, Marea Coffee, Cape Horn Coffee Importers, San Franciscan Roaster Company, Crossings Coffee, Civets Roasting Machines, First Light Coffee Whiskey, Hasea Coffee Source, and Coffee Cycle Roasting. I will be at Coffee Cycle in Pacific Beach, San Diego for a meet and greet and a maker's market on Saturday, December 9th. Be sure to stop by, better yet, ride your bicycle down, and let's have a cup of coffee together. If you can't make it, I still encourage you to shop local as much as you can this holiday season. That's all for today, but stay tuned. After the show, I'm going to share some audio from a recent green coffee chat about pea berries that I had with Luke's brother Jared for our monthly coffee education column. This show is part of the Roast West Coast Coffee Network, and this episode is, was, has been written, produced, and recorded as always, by me, Ryan Wolt. Always tip your baristas, and be sure to drink good coffee.
If I could go back in time and start the Roast West Coast program over, I would start by saying, hey, Jared, do you want to talk about green coffee? That's what I would do. Yeah. I would, yeah. Uh, and so I'm glad you're here now, but I, if I could go back in time, that's that's how I would use my time travel abilities. I'm honored. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, you're here for another uh, talking session uh, on the Hasea Coffee Sources Green Coffee column, which we post every month on RoastWestCoast.com. I steal a lot of information from you off of HaseaCoffee.com, where you and your brother post all kinds of stuff about green coffee and cupping and tasting, and it's, it's great. Uh, it's how I learn a lot of things is by reading on HaseaCoffee.com. Cool. You're back to talk a little bit about green coffee with us this this month. What uh, what yeah. are we what are we learning about today? Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. Today, something that a lot of people ask about are pea berries. What are pea berries? Are they a good thing? It's um, that little cartoon dog, isn't it? <laughs> oh no, that's uh, Peabody. My bad. Peabody. No, no, no. We're talking about green coffee pea berries, or roasted, right? Pea berries are a natural mutation in the coffee plant when only one seed develops inside of coffee berry. So normally two seeds are developing inside of each of those cherries, which is why you kind of see in most coffee, one side is almost flat and the other side is rounded. Those flat sides sit with a a second seed, kind of flat side to flat side and the rounded the rounded sides are on the outside where the where the skin would be right yep i'm going to share a diagram of that on the Perfect. website so if you're Thank listening you. or reading you'll see that a picture of that uh with that would be helpful i'm 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 describing it with my hands too which <laughs> i realize is not going to be very helpful here so a diagram is perfect <laughs> so the pea berry is when only one seed develops rather than two what ends up happening is the seed is almost completely rounded, you know, if you draw a line through the center of it. So it doesn't have the one flat side to, that's required to kind of share space within the cherry. It's just like a, a rounded seed. Because essentially there's, uh, there's not another seed pushing on it in the middle, flattening right. it out. Right. Uh, it can kind of just grow into like the shape of a, a BB or something else. A yeah, exactly. The shape of the cherry, the natural shape of the cherry. Right. So rather than almost being split in half, it's just one. Now, after coffee is dried and ready to ship and everything, it gets sorted. Uh, it gets sorted by bean size. It gets sorted by density, among other things. And pea berries are obviously a really unique shape. Uh, so they usually are sorted out and separated from the rest of the coffee. For various reasons, people prefer pea berries or avoid them. Now, historically, bigger beans are more desirable in green coffee. I don't really agree with that statement. A lot of times the middle-sized beans tend to taste best <laughs> in my experience. Uh, for whatever reason, by sorting out, you know, by filtering the, the coffee by size, the pea berries essentially always end up kind of at the bottom because of their, their small size. So by being so small, they can be considered undesirable as being like the smallest bean size. It can be, it can even be considered like a grade, you know, so in some countries, the grade for bean size might be like A, B, C, and pea berry, A being the largest, <laughs> right? But on the other end, they could be really desirable because the theory is it's not sharing the, all of the nutrition in the fruit with another seed. So one seed gets all of the nutrition of that each berry, right? And in theory, would taste better by having full access to, to the whole cherry. Now, I've tasted a lot of pea berries separated out, and I can say that there's really no rule. <laughs> you can, I've tasted really, I've tasted pea berries alongside other coffees from the same farms that taste better or worse, um, or the same. I've tasted it all. 
So from my experience, from just blind cupping coffee, pea berry really does not seem to have like an inherent advantage in quality. In fact, a lot of times I see producers or, or more like large groups or co-ops or exporters, not necessarily producers, they try to kind of pitch the pea berry as something that you should pay more for uh, without really spending the attention or the time and care on developing the coffee. And so a lot of times the pea berry gets offered from, you know, lower quality supply chains in my, in my experience and actually doesn't cup as well. But again, I don't think it has anything to do with the pea berry itself as much as the, you know, the practices that went into producing it. Yeah, I th- that was kind of a short. <laughs> you mentioned something that I think we're going to get into in the future because I'm already thinking of 100 questions about it. You, you mentioned that they, some places rank the size of the, of the bean, which is honestly not something I've ever really thought of. So I wanted to just, before we go today, follow that up with when a coffee harvest is, is picked and completed, I don't, I don't think I really thought about how there's going to be coffee beans from like the same batch, let's say that are all different sizes. And you mentioned the sorting process. Are those then packaged and sold as green coffee as a relatively like uniform size, like bag A would be kind of all the same bag, you know, the next bag would be kind of the same. And is that better than if the beans are all different sizes, like mixed together to create like a more representative batch from that harvest? So the issue by that comes up when you mix all of the different sizes is related to the various densities that are mixed together. Pea berry could be more dense because of the way it's shaped. When you put all these seeds that have a different density into a coffee roaster, they're going to roast at different rates and you're going to get really inconsistent results when you roast it. So it generally is better to have like a tighter range when you're roasting. It's really, it's really about roasting and, and that process. So for example, if I were a roaster, I would prefer to have like the A beans all separated and then buy the pea berry beans separated from the A and roast both of them separately rather than having one batch of A and pea berry blended together. Not because the two coffees are bad or one is better than the other, but just because of how they're gonna roast is gonna be so significantly different. Uh, you know, I'll have to approach the A beans with a different heat application than the pea berry beans. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Jared, I really appreciate uh, all this knowledge you're bringing me, but I also have a complaint, which is every time we talk, I end up with more questions <laughs> than I've just had answered. So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to you coming back. I know we're going to probably talk about this grading, ranking, green coffee thing in the future, because that seems really interesting to me. And now I know that when I see pea berries at $30 for a 12 ounce bag, I should at least think about it. Yeah, taste it. Try to taste it first. <laughs> Hello, are you still there? Um, the show is over. Even the part about pea bears with Jared is over. But I'm still sitting here, just amazed that we're nearing the end of 2023, and already we're more than halfway through season 9 on this podcast. We'll be back next week with a wildly entertaining conversation with Noah Vernick of Anomaly Coffee in Long Beach, California. And then we're closing out the season with a pair of episodes featuring the founders of Sprudge.com. So, yeah, get excited. Talk to you soon.